Um, is that an announcement there? Is that an announcement? I don't think so. I think we're fine. Yes. Oh, uh, about the poster session, contact me if you want to present a poster. If you have sent already to the, to the secretary, um, then don't contact me because I have the information already. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, in this talk, I plan to talk about magnetism and how you investigate it experimentally. So it's very much from the experimentalist's point of view. It's things like how do you choose a material that is likely to have interesting magnetism and how do you investigate it and what, how do you interpret the data, what does that mean and what do you learn in the process. So I hope that this will be useful for you. I know many of you are theorists, but it might help you interpret experimental papers and see how experiments can be used to verify theories. So the outline. Outline, I will talk about conventional magnets. This is probably something you all know. Conventional magnets. Ah. Um, no mouse. One moment, please. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about, first of all, a refresher of conventional magnets, just in case you don't know something or need it to be reminded. Ah, do you have a mouse? Or is it? The point? Oh, it doesn't work. I, it does? Ah, oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Ah, it's the top. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, so, yes. Wrong, wrong slide. Um, conventional magnets, and then what, is, what are the necessary ingredients to get away from conventional magnetism? By conventional magnetism, long range order, spin wave excitation, things you can calculate quite simply. And are not particularly exciting. Um, how do you change the magnetism, make it unexpected to get exotic ground states? Um, and this is the most uh, interesting type of magnetism, probably is frustrated magnetism, um, where you have competing interactions that suppress long-range magnetic order, so you don't have a long-range order ground state in the traditional sense with static moments. You have fluctuations in the ground state and you have different types of excitations from spin waves. Then I shall talk briefly about how you can select materials for frustration, which look like good candidates for investigation and can be used to test theories. Then I'll talk about experiments. This is probably the next hour after lunch. Um, in particular, focusing on neutron scattering as the main technique to investigate unconventional magnets. And then finally end with some examples and we'll see how many of these we can do. So conventional magnets, so conventional magnets, as you all know, um, the electrons have spin and orbital angular momentum. Normally you sum the spin and orbital angular momentum of the unpaired electrons. This is the important electrons uh, for magnetism because they can give a net moment, um, and the moment is given via uh, the Bohr magnetron. And then that would be the moment of the atom. And just to remember that, of course, let's now focus on the spin rather than the orbital. The spin um, angular momentum is, is a quantum number. It's a quantum quantity. Um, and therefore, it can only take certain predefined values with respect to a particular axis. In the case of spin 5 halves, like the manganese 2 plus iron, this is a trans light transition metal iron, very typically found in multiferroic materials, it has spin 5 halves, and therefore, if you put it in a magnetic field, you can actually split these states into six um, particular orientations with respect to an axis. Okay, so 
Then we have magnetic ions. That's the first thing to decide upon in a material. Um, then you want to think about your interactions. Let's take a very simple interaction, the Heisenberg interaction. This is isotropic. Of course, we can have ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic, depending on the sign of the interaction strength. And it's given by this two-particle or two-magnetic ion dot product. And then in a typical lattice, we have different types of interactions. We, so the blue dots here represent the magnetic ions. Um, in a two-dimensional material, like is drawn here, we can have different types of interactions along different directions. And this would all be due to the crystal symmetry. For example, if the A axis was different from the B axis, you would expect the interactions along the A axis to be different from those along the B axis. So example here is lanthanum cuprate, but we can go to other systems. I think you just learned about one-dimensional systems where we can get one-dimensional magnets. For example, potassium copper trifluoride, here the interactions only go in one direction now, and you can use field theories to study them. Or we can have alternating magnets, alternating interactions, for example, strong and weak, or ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic, going in a particular direction. We can also have anisotropic interactions, and this can also be important when I talk later about frustration. So, you have magnetic ions, they're coupled together by magnetic interactions into a lattice. Um, at high temperatures, the system is fluctuating, the spins are fluctuating, the system is effectively a paramagnet, you start cooling the material down, and when the interaction strength becomes of the order of the temperature, then they can start to settle into a fixed um, either short-range ordered or long-range ordered state. The long-range ordered state would happen below the nail or Curie temperature. That's the real space image. But we often measure in reciprocal space. So what we would see here, well, what we'd see here is just very diffuse scattering. What we would see here at low temperatures are Bragg peaks due to this order. These are not structural Bragg peaks. They would be new Bragg peaks due to magnetic order, due to this regular arrangement. So you could have a system which has structural Bragg peaks given by the blue dots, and magnetic Bragg peaks would appear below the nail temperature. And these could be represented by the red dots in this reciprocal space plane. Now we have a long range ordered ground state. The spins are pointing for a long time in a particular direction. Um, but we can create excitations about that state, and they are typically spin waves. Spin waves are a collective fluctuation of the spin moments about the ordered state. These are spin waves on a ferromagnet, or on a ferromagnet, this is a snapshot in time. Um, and in reciprocal space, so that was real space, in reciprocal space, we would see um, a well-defined tra trajectory like a sinusoidal type dispersion as a function of wave vector and energy. It's an excitation now, so it costs energy, and the energy trajectory through wave vector would follow a sinusoidal path. This is a ferromagnet spin wave dispersion, and this is the spin wave dispersion of an antiferromagnet. Okay, so this was probably revision. Um, Unconventional magnets. So here now we want to have on new ground states where we don't have long range order or it is at least suppressed and different types of excitations. So where do we get unconventional magnetism? Well, normally we can get it if we are able to get the spins to fluctuate at low temperatures. Instead of ordering, they fluctuate. Um, quantum fluctuations, for example, can suppress long range magnetic order and if you don't have long-range magnetic order, then spin wave theory is going to fail because it assumes a long-range ordered ground state. And what might you need to get this to happen? Well, some of the ingredients are to have a low spin value, like spin half rather than spin five halves, antiferromagnetic exchange interactions. Um, these are uh, less stable towards disorder. Um, low dimensional interactions 
and frustrated interactions. And if you just take the simple two-spin Hamiltonian shown here, convert it from coordinates to ladder operators, this term represents the long-range order, and this term represents the fluctuations. And it's focusing on this term to disorder the ground state and prevent static magnetism. So the ingredients were, first of all, to have a low spin value. So I mentioned spin 5 halves iron has um, six possible states with respect to a particular axis. OK, so if you operate now here, you're going to change the spin quantum number by one unit. Let's say from 5 halves to 3 halves. The general direction is quite similar. It's still pointing generally up. If you were to do that on the spin halves iron, you would flip the spin, this one, from down to up. So if you've only got two states, you start changing the state. You can only go down if you're up or up if you're down. So this is much more susceptible to fluctuations. Um, the other ingredient was to have antiferromagnetic interactions rather than ferromagnetic interactions. This is, of course, not always true, but it is true in simple systems. And here I've drawn the ferromagnetic ground state for a one-dimensional magnet. Of course, a one-dimensional magnet does not have long-range order, but over a short distance it could have. Um, so if we were to act with our Hamiltonian on just, let's say, two ferromagnetically aligned spins, um, so that state would be up, up, then the Hamiltonian would give us back the same state. So we would have an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. It's the two spins being up. Now, if we take a simple opposite system, which is just a simple, the nail state, one spin up, one spin down, and act with the Hamiltonian on it, then we go to this line, the Hamiltonian acting on one up and two down, starts mixing in not just one up and two down, but one down and two up due to um, this term here. And so we don't get back the same state. So an antiferromagnetic ground state is actually not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. Or simple nail state is not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. The uh, third ingredient was to have low dimensional interactions um, so this is quite simple to understand. It's just, I think, a simple magnet, a cubic system like this. It's actually antiferromagnetic along this direction and ferromagnetic in the other directions. But each spin is coupled by magnetic ions um, to the left, to the right, to the top, to the bottom, to the front, to the back. It has six neighbors. And this is enough to create a mean field that is able to stabilize long-range order or static magnetism. In one dimensions, um, each spin only has two neighbors, to the left and to the right. And this is not enough to stabilize long-range magnetic order. The fourth ingredient was frustration. And this I'll go on into more depth about. Frustration can be understood as competing interactions. So for some lattices, it's just simply not possible for the spins to find a configuration that will satisfy all the interactions present. Um, this is what geometrical frustration is. Now, if you take the square lattice with antiferromagnetic interactions, you can see nearest neighbor antiferromagnetic interactions. You can see that you can satisfy every bond. Every bond is antiferromagnetic, and every bond has an up and a down spin at either end. But if you have a triangular system, you cannot satisfy this. If you have antiferromagnetic interactions on a triangle, you can satisfy one of the bonds um, with antiparallel spins. But the second bond would want this to be up, but the third bond would want this to be down. And so it's not possible to satisfy all the interactions simultaneously. And it's the inability of the system to decide on a particular ground state. It has several ground states. It could be up, could be down, could fluctuate between the two, 
can't decide what to do. This is what suppresses long-range magnetic order to temperatures that are lower than would be expected given the strength of the exchange interactions. That would be Tn is very much smaller than the Curie-Weiss temperature. That's a representative exchange interaction strength, and this is the ordering temperature. And also, even when you do order and you've gone to zero Kelvin, if you could get there, you'd still find that the size of the ordered moment um, was very much smaller, or smaller than the available spin moment. But that's the ground state. It's partially ordered and can be partially dynamic. The remaining spins would be in a state of fluctuation. And then the excitations are also changed. We don't have a simple long-range ordered ground state, so we can't really use a simple theory like spin wave theory, which assumes this ground state. You can use it, but it'll only be an approximation. You'll find that, it, um, that the true excitations are renormalized. That means they are shifted downwards or upwards with respect to the excitations predicted by a spin wave calculation, and they are also much broader than the prediction, which, of course, spin wave in predicts sharp excitations. Okay, so that's magnetic frustration. And if we take magnetic frustration to the extreme, um, take magnetic frustration to the extreme, very strong magnetic frustration, then we can get a spin liquid ground state. This is when even at the lowest temperature you can achieve experimentally, or if you do your theory, you put in the ground state, you'll find that you cannot find long-range magnetic order. Not just that, not simple order ferromagnet or antiferromagnet, you also can't find static magnetism. It's not even a, a short-range order. Um, the spins are, in fact, moving in the ground state. Um, and also that the excitations cannot really be described as magnons or spin waves. Uh, magnons and spin waves appear as sharp excitations from an ordered ground state and are characterized by the spin quantum number of one. Um, in fact, the true excitations are, in many cases, spin-ons. Spin-ons have a fractional quantum number of spin a half. And are particularly interesting excitations because of this fractional quantum number and because experimentally you can't create them. You can't create a single spin-on because your scattering rule cannot give you a fractional excitation. Oh, your experimental um, selection rules, any experimental selection rule is unable to give you a spin half excitation. So now a classical spin liquid. So this can happen when you've got a large spin, of course, and then you can have many possible ground states. And the system can visit these ground states at a finite temperature. Um, so we have a highly macroscopic, it's macroscopically degenerate ground state manifold of excitation, of, of possible ground states. Um, for a quantum spin liquid, it's possible to take a superposition. So the quantum fluctuations allow you to access the, the ground states and possibly also the low-lying excitations. Um, and they may select a particular ground state, which is a particular superposition of the classical manifold. Um, and this would probably be a fluctuating um, system where the spins are, are dynamic and not static. The spin liquids have uh, no long-range magnetic order, no static magnetism, considered to have a highly entangled ground state, possibly with a topological order, and spin-on excitations. So now, practical considerations for getting frustrated magnets in real life. Um, there are different types of frustration. If I go back. There are different types of frustration to be considered. Some just arise from the crystal symmetry um, 
with first neighbor interactions. Some require first and second neighbor interactions um, to be able to generate the competition between um, different states that destabilizes the ground state. And then thirdly, you can introduce anisotropy, and this acts as an additional form, um, method of creating competition between interactions and magnetic um, and the magnetic ions. So I will talk about each one. Uh, geometrical frustration is the first one, the simplest one. Um, here we have geometries like triangles or tetrahedra, so we have three spins here. You can satisfy two of the bonds but not the third bond on the triangle. And if you choose a crystal with a structure that involves magnetic ions on triangles, you're likely to see frustration. Tetrahedra can also appear in crystal structures. Here we have four spins making this um, sort of threefold pyramid. Again, it's not possible to, if all the bonds are the same and are antiferromagnetic, it's not possible to satisfy them all. We can satisfy this one, but whatever we put here is not going to satisfy both of these. The same for that one. So this requires some type of motif, like the triangle or the tetrahedron, and it requires antiferromagnetic interactions in the simple case on the first neighbor bonds. So here are some examples of frustrated magnets in two dimensions we can have corner-sharing triangles, like this. This system's quite frustrated, but actually develops long-range magnetic order at low temperatures. But if you make the edge, make, instead of edge-sharing triangles, you make them corner-sharing, as shown here, um, you can actually generate more frustration, and this system is thought to be a spin liquid. You can also have triangles in three dimensions. It gets a bit harder to visualize, but you can make, it's called the hypercagame lattice, you can make um, corner sharing triangles like this, and they actually can fill up a whole three-dimensional lattice in this way. And also in three dimensions, the famous lattice, another famous lattice is the pyrochlor lattice. Here now we have corner sharing tetrahedra, Okay, so geometrical frustration in the simplest sense is that due to geometry, it's not possible to satisfy all the interactions. Normally, you need triangular or tetrahedral motifs, and you need antiferromagnetic interactions between first neighbors. Now, the second type is um, frustration due to competing interactions. I mean, there's more than one interaction. There's not just the first neighbor. There's also the second or further neighbor interactions. Um, and here, the second neighbor and further neighbor interactions can compete with the first neighbor interactions to produce frustration. They don't all have to be antiferromagnetic now. Some can be ferromagnetic, but at least one must be antiferromagnetic. So we can go to the square lattice. Square lattice, so we have the magnetic ions here. Square lattices are unfrustrated normally with first neighbor interactions. Here we have both first neighbors. That would be the first neighbor, but we also have the second neighbor across the diagonal. That's the J2. So now, if we just satisfy the first neighbor interaction with antiferromagnetic, assuming antiferromagnetic bonds, we can have a simple up down pattern. This satisfies the solid lines assuming they are antiferromagnetic. So this could be the ground state. But now if we just have the second neighbor and we don't have the first neighbor, we have to have a different ground state. Here now we must have antiparallel spins along the dotted lines. Actually, the system separates into two sublattices the red one and the blue one, and they don't connect to each other. The connection would be the first neighbor interaction. 
If I turn on the first neighbor interaction, let's say it's ferromagnetic, it's satisfied here, but not satisfied here. Or if it's antiferromagnetic, then it's satisfied here, but it's not satisfied here. So the second neighbor interaction, the first neighbor interaction would compete with the second neighbor interaction. This is a, a plot um, showing J1 here. J1 is fer antiferromagnetic or ferromagnetic. J2 is zero along this line. J2 is antiferromagnetic or ferromagnetic, and J1 is zero along this line. So let's say we've got a J2, which is antiferromagnetic. If we start introducing a bit of J1, that means we start going round the circle this way. Um, at some point, the J1 and, and the J2 will compete to, with each other to the point that it can't, the system can't decide on a ground state. And we enter a possible spin-liquid state in this region. Same happens if we introduced a ferromagnetic J1 by going this way around the circle. Again, if it becomes large enough, it will compete with the second neighbor interaction. Okay, another example is the honeycomb. The honeycomb lattice, actually, if you just consider first neighbor interactions, is not frustrated. We have magnetic ions forming a honeycomb. The first neighbor are the black lines. Um, if you have the first neighbor only, we can have a ferromagnet or uh, a ferromagnet or an antiferromagnet. You can satisfy every single bond. Going back to the ferromagnet, now if that's the first neighbor, now we can introduce, sec introduce second neighbors. These are the dotted red lines. So these couple this and this spin, also this and this, this and this, this and this. Now, if the second neighbor is antiferromagnetic, you can see there's a problem and there's a competition between what the two interactions would like. The same goes if the first neighbor is antiferromagnetic and we introduce an antiferromagnetic second neighbor, again, there is competition between the two interactions. This, of course, is parallel aligned spins, whereas this bond is antiferromagnetic. In three dimensions, this can also happen on the diamond lattice. This is the diamond lattice. So here, the blue and green are actually equivalent. Um, in the diamond lattice, we have tetrahedra shown here, and there's also an ion in the center of the tetrahedron. And if you have antiferromagnetic interactions, you could pattern first neighbor interactions. You could pattern the um, lattice with spins like this, simple up and down between nearest neighbors. But if you were to introduce antiferromagnetic second neighbor interactions, there would be a problem because it would then disagree with the first neighbor interaction. Okay, the third type of frustration that I will discuss is frustration arising from anisotropy. This is uh, now competition between an anisotropy and the interactions. The, so far, I've been only discussing interactions which are isotropic, where the spin can point in any direction with the same magnitude. But in some materials, especially materials with unquenched orbital moment, you can have preferred directions for the spins to point in. And then, if, depending on the crystal symmetry, these preferred directions of the different spins may actually be non-collinear and therefore may um, compete with the interactions which prefer parallel or anti-parallel spins. So the typical example is the pyrochlor lattice. The pyrochlor lattice is corner-sharing tetrahedra. Here's the tetrahedra again, and here's the pyrochlor lattice showing the corner-sharing tetrahedra in three dimensions. Um, now, let's pretend we now have isotropic interactions, just simple isotropic interactions, for example, from a chromium ion. And we put these on the pyrochlor. If the first neighbor interaction is antiferromagnetic, then the system is highly geometrically frustrated. 
possibly a spin liquid. Um, but, of course, if the interactions, first name interactions are ferromagnetic, ferromagnetic, all the spins can just point in the same direction and every bond is satisfied and there's no frustration. But if we introduce anisotropy, and here the anisotropy is different for each ion. We have a magnetic ion here, four on each tetrahedra, and the anisotropy direction points towards the center of the tetrahedra. Um, and of course, it's a different direction for this ion because the center is a different direction for this ion than it is for this ion. So then the anisotropy directions are non-collinear. Um, now, if you have antiferromagnetic interactions, the spins can only point parallel or antiparallel to this anisotropy direction. Um, and in fact, with antiferromagnetic interactions, the system can find a unique ground state and develops a type of ordering where all the spins point into the tetrahedra, this one, and then out of the neighboring one, and into the neighbor, the, this one, and then out. It, it's an alternating pattern. But if we have ferromagnetic interactions on the pyrochlor lattice, and the same anisotropy, now the order is not so simple. It's two spins must point in, and two spins must point out. This is something that can be worked out just by minimizing the energy on a single tetrahedron. You find that two spins want to point in and two spins want to point out, and that's the minimizes the energy. The problem is, however, that it can be any two spins pointing in and any two spins pointing out. And there's a very large number of ways you can do this. If you would take this pattern, this is just one option. We could reverse um, the spins around this loop, for example, or probably this loop. And we'd still satisfy the two in, two out rule. So there's many different ground states. And um, in fact, the ferromagnetic interactions between highly anisotropic Ising spins on the pyrochlor lattice gives rise to the famous spin liquid known as spin ice in the presence of classical spins, which has monopole excitations. Sorry? I believe so, but maybe this is one. Yes, I believe so. But I... Hmm? Topological order parameter. Um, yeah, I should leave that one for the experts. I believe so, yes. <laughs> Sorry? I can't, I can't hear you. Sorry. I'm talking about classical spins just now. Okay. Let me hear. We have an expert. <laughs> Um, right. I, I hope that gave you an idea of types of frustration. Um, now I want to talk about real, real materials and how you can actually achieve this. So, Real materials can actually approximate these ideal models and can be used to test these theoretical concepts. They can actually also, instead of just testing theories, they can also provide inspiration to theories. Sometimes a real material may show unusual excitations and on ground state, and it wasn't um, a, a model that had been considered before. Um, and then it provides an inspiration for new calculations. So what do we need to consider? We need to consider mag magnetic ions. Um, which magnetic ions should we have on our lattice? And for this, uh, we must consider 
not just the magnetic ion all its, so its valence, because the valence will determine the number of unpaired electrons, and therefore the magnetic moment via Hund's rule. And um, also, some magnetic ions have more, have more susceptible to being anisotropic than other magnetic ions. For example, rare earth ions tend to be anisotropic, whereas light transition metals tend to be isotropic. So these are all things to consider. Then there's the symmetry of the crystal. Um, so this crystal symmetry will place these magnetic ions in certain positions due to the crystal symmetry, to satisfy the crystal symmetry. Um, and if you choose carefully, you can get lattices of magnetic ions which show triangular or tetrahedral arrangements and can be frustrated. Symmetry also can determine the anisotropy directions. So here I'm going to talk about light transition metals. Light transition metals, ions, um, this would be the 3D shell. In the periodic table, the 3D shell is shown here. Light transition metal ions normally have quenched orbitals due to the strong crystal field. Um, because they are, form an outermost shell within the iron. And so when you put them in a crystal, the surrounding, um, magnet, the surrounding, for example, oxygen ions produce a quenching field. Then the magnetic moment is due to the spin only, or mostly, and the magnetic moment is isotropic. Um, many ions have several valences, so many of these transition metals can take several valences, and each valence will have a different value of spin. And to be care one needs to be careful about that. Of course, spin half is particularly interesting if you want to have a quantum magnet. So, the light transition metals, this is the 3D shell. The 3D shell has five orbital states. Each can be filled by two, um, two electrons, spin up and spin down. So in total, there are 10 states. Also, the 4S shell also tends to get filled. The 4S is here, filled or partially filled, and this has two states. So let's look at copper. Copper is a very important iron for magnetic materials. Copper has <coughs> bare copper metal has... Um, looks like argon. Argon is here. It has argon plus an additional 11 electrons to get to here. And those 11 electrons, 10 of them, go into the 3D shell, and one of them goes into the 4S shell. So the 4S shell can hold two electrons, but it just holds one. So you can remove an electron from copper, question is which electron? Well, it just so happens that it's normally the lone electron in the 4S shell. That means that the 3D, the 3D shell is completely filled with electrons, and a completely free filled shell has spin zero, because it's got five up spins and five down spins. So net spin is zero. So now let's remove another electron. We have copper 2 plus. So we have to remove one now from the 3D shell. So now we have uh, nine electrons. Um, nine electrons, and they are each, each orbital can have one up and one down. That means one orbital will only have one electron, um, giving a net moment of spin half. So copper can take these two valences. So Herbert Smithite, Herbert Smithite, thought to be um, a quantum Kagame antiferromagnet. Actually, this is its chemical formula. It's a natural mineral, and it looks like this, but you can also grow it in the lab. So we have to think about what would the valence of our copper be? It can be one plus or two plus. 
One plus would not be interesting because it would be non-magnetic. Um, well, zinc always takes two plus, oxygen always takes two minus, hydrogen takes minus one, chlorine takes plus one, and they have this ratio one, three, six, six, two, and of course, the total sum of the charges must be zero. So we can work through the maths, two zincs, three coppers, which are valence are unknown, six oxygens, six hydrogens, uh, two chlorines. Times their valences, of course, means that the valence of the copper must be two to balance the charge, which is good because that means we have copper two plus ions which have spin half. Right, so this is the crystal structure of Herbert Smithite. And every ion is, every ion is shown here. And uh, one thing to note is that it has a space group R three bar M. The three bar suggests threefold symmetry. M would be a reflection plane. R would mean um, a trigonal group. Okay, so what we're interested in is the copper ions. These are the magnetic ones, and they are blue. So here, the bright blue ones show the top layer, and then below there's another layer, and there's some faint blue ones. So we just do look at the bright blue ones. Of course, we also have zinc and chlorine and oxygen. But what you can see here is copper, 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 and in between we have an oxygen. The bond is not straight, but the direct distance from this copper to this copper, if you drew direct distances around them, you would get a triangle, even though the bonds themselves don't form triangles. This is actually the AB plane of Herbert Smithite. You can rotate the crystal around and now look in the AC plane. So that means we've turned this plane and turned it now horizontal. So now the copper ions occupy a layer and this layer is separated from this layer. And in between the two layers, we have the gray ions, which are zinc. And zinc are non-magnetic. So all this seems to suggest we have triangles of copper. Another triangle here, another triangle here. If we draw just the direct distances between them, we will get a Kagame lattice of copper ions. That's in the AB plane. This Kagame lattice occupies um, a confined distance along C, just this. It forms a layer, and this Kagame plane is separated from the layer below by zinc and chlorine. And all this suggests is that these distance, this distance is quite large with non-magnetic ions between, and probably there is no connection between these layers, no magnetic connection. But these distances are shorter with oxygen bonds and probably have strong antiferromagnetic interactions. In fact, it is known that um, when you have copper, oxygen, copper, so here we just have one of the triangles, you have copper, oxygen, copper, and the bond between them is 180 degrees. It's not 180 degrees, it maybe it's 100. 60 degrees, but it's close to 180 degrees, then according to the good enough Kanamori Anderson rules, we should have antiferromagnetic interactions. Okay, so this is a well studied material. It's a candidate for a quantum Kagame. Um, it's been used to test theories, it has one drawback and all real materials have drawbacks. And this is that it has copper-zinc disorder, a small amount of copper-zinc disorder. That means there's a coppers on the zinc side and zincs on the copper side. That means there may be some vacancies on the Kagame layers, some non-magnetic ions. And this can be a bit of a problem. So it only approximates an ideal Kagame, of course. Next example is um, copper chromate. 
So we actually have two, magnetic, two possible magnetic ions here, copper and chromium. Chrom copper can be, um, been, have valence one or two. Chromium can have many valences. So oxygen always has minus one. So that the sum of the valence of the copper and chromium must be four, plus four. That's all we know for now. Chromium has five electrons, uh, sorry, six electrons. It's positioned here. So it's argon plus six electrons. Argon is a stable unit plus six electrons. One goes into the 4S shell and um, five of them go into the 3D shell. So I just tell you actually now that chromium will like the valence 3 plus because it has many options for valences. But actually in an octahedral environment, as happens in this ion, so the chromium is surrounded by six oxygens in an octahedral environment, it will normally take the valence 3 plus. So if that's 3 plus, we're going to have to remove three electrons. We're going to have three electrons in the 3D shell, none in the 4S shell. Now we have to use Hund's rule. Hund's rule, first rule says you need to maximize the spin. You fill up with spin up first, and after that with spin down. We've only got three electrons, they're all going to be spin up. So the total spin is three halves. Now, if chromium, of course, takes three plus valence, that must mean that the copper takes one plus valence, and one plus has spin zero. So we're just dealing with one magnetic ion. This is the structure of copper chromate. These are the copper layers, and then these are the chromium oxygen layers. Actually, the chromiums are inside this octahedra. There's the little shadow inside. And it's surrounded by, each one is surrounded by six oxygens. That's called, an octa, that's called an octahedral environment. That's a crystal field. So I told you, with a crystal, octahedral environment, you'll take the three plus valence normally. Also, you notice that these are edge sharing. Now, actually, maybe we should probably look at this layer here. So you've got a chromium inside here, or chromium oxygen octahedra here, and here, and here, and here. And actually, they form a triangular lattice. Um, that's to be expected because the space group is trigonal. It's called a three-bar M. Three-bar would suggest that you've got three-fold symmetry. So the chromium ions form a triangular lattice. As you see, these triangle, this triangle triangle layer of chromium ions is well separated from the next layer by a non-magnetic layer of non-magnetic copper ions. Um, one other thing to bear in mind is that, of course, these chromium ions are going to interact with each other by exchange interactions. And the question is, what is the strength of what is the sign of those exchange interactions, a ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic? Um, well, with three electrons in a octahedral environment, you tend to feel the, the T2G levels, these are the T2G um, orbitals, and the T2G orbitals point along the edges of the octahedra, and so each chromium ion will have its orbitals pointing towards each other, um, and of course each orbital is filled by just one electron, and that favors an antiferromagnetic interaction. So this is actually a good example of a triangular lattice antiferromagnet, but it's a real material and it has additional terms in its Hamiltonian. In this case, it has a second neighbor coupling. It also has some other issues which make it quite interesting. It has very strong coupling between the magnetic system and the um, lattice. So it has magnon phonon coupling. And this also leads to multiferroic behavior in this system. Okay, so now I'm going to 
next topic is to talk about experimental methods. So I just briefly outlined some methods here, and then I will talk about neutron scattering. So what do you want to know? You've got a material. You think it's interesting. You've grown it in your lab. What do you do next? Well, question one, do we have long-range magnetic order? Because if we don't, or it is suppressed, this is a good sign. Susceptibility can show you the transition very simply. You put this, the material in a magnetic field, and you measure its magnetization, its response to that field. And you do this as a function of temperature. And most materials will show a transition, which will be a peak or some sort of um, um, feature in the susceptibility at a particular temperature indicating the transition. The susceptibility can also be used to determine the Curie-Weiss temperature, which is an indication of the strength of the interactions. So we're looking interested in materials which have no nail temperature at all, no ordering, or where the ordering temperature is very much smaller than the Curie-Weiss temperature. In particular, materials which have um, enhanced correlations well above the nail temperature, temperatures higher than the nail temperature, are probably showing a, a response, some collective response to a, an applied magnetic field, suggesting a collective magnetic behavior, but which is unable to stabilize long-range order. Um, and so that's some feature to look out for. You can also look for the transition temperature by doing heat capacity measurements as a function of temperature. Um, again, you can see your transition should be a lambda anomaly, a very sharp peak at a particular temperature indicating the transition. Um, but you also, I mean, heat capacity is basically a measure of the density of states, a measure of the entropy. Um, and so your a me measurement of the heat capacity as a function of temperature can show you if you have a low line density of states um, at low energies, which would suggest you have um, competing ground states or alternative ground states to the one that was selected. And also, if not all the entropy is released exactly at the transition temperature, but continues to be released at higher temperatures, this is another sign um, that your system uh, shows unconventional magnetism. Now, if you actually want to investigate that ground state, muon spin rotation is the technique to use. It's very sensitive to magnetic order. Very weak magnetic order can show up in muon spin rotation. It can determine whether you have static magnetic order or even if you don't have long-range magnetic order. So it can determine a spin glass. Um, and alternatively, it can also show you if your ground state is not static, if the spins are moving. So this is a very important way to investigate the ground state. And then the last method is neutrons. And I will talk more about that in the next part. So I have, yes, I have five minutes, so I will just start on that. So I'm going to talk quite in detail about neutron scattering because it's an important technique um, for quantum magnets. It's a way to measure the excitations and gives a very direct comparison, direct and quantitative comparison between a theoretical model and a real material. So you can do a quantitative comparison um, of theories. Um, so neutron scattering. OK, so start at the beginning with the neutron. Neutron scattering is literally scattering neutrons from a sample. You fire neutrons at your sample. Your sample scatters the neutrons. You collect the scattered neutrons. And you measure where they are scattered, in which direction. And you measure the energy that they have and the energy difference between the initial and final neutrons. So it's all about how the neutron interacts with the sample. Now, the neutron, of course, is a nuclear particle. It has a mass similar to the proton. It has no electrical charge. And this is important because it can penetrate deep inside a material. 
and it has a spin angular momentum of a half. And this is important because it makes it sensitive to magnetic fields inside the material. Um, because it has a spin angular momentum, it has a magnetic moment. And actually, it has a finite lifetime of 15 minutes. So, neutron scattering is in many ways like X-ray scattering, um, but has some major differences. Of course, in X-ray scattering, you're always dealing with the fact that of the speed of light as the main constant. You don't have that with neutron scattering. The neutron can take a range of energies. Um, so here, the mass for the neutron, the neutron has a momentum if it is moving. It's always created with a motion. Um, its, its momentum is its mass times its velocity, which, of course, is also it's a quantum mechanical particle. It's also h cross times its wave vector. That means, of course, that its velocity is related to its wave vector, and its wave vector is related to its velocity. Now, it has a wave vector. It's a quantum mechanical particle, so it has a wave vector, so it has a wavelength, of course, wavelength and wave vector. And the wave vector and wavelength are related like this to pi over the wave vector. So actually, you can also write the wave vector in terms of the velocity. Remember, the velocity can take a range of values. Depends on how you create it. And then it has an energy. And its energy is its kinetic energy. It's half mv squared. But velocity can be replaced by wave vector. This. So we have energy, we have wave vector, we have velocity, and we have wavelength. These are four quantities, and they are all related. And if you know one of them, you know the other, all the others. So that was the point here to show you the mass for a neutron. So two minutes. So the neutron, this is the important part. How does the neutron interact with a material? Well, first of all, it's a nuclear particle. Um, and therefore, it interacts via the strong nuclear force um, with other nuclei that it sees inside the material. And this is a very short range force. But it has a magnetic moment and therefore interacts with magnetic fields that it sees in a material. Why might there be magnetic fields? Well, we have unpaired electrons going around in current loops in orbitals, generating magnetic fields as they go. Or we have spin moments. And so the electrons, or the unpaired electrons, in a material can uh, scatter the neutrons. So if our neutrons come in, this is our material. We have primitive nuclei here with one electron going around and they form a lattice, and we have our neutrons going in. The first method is the neutron nuclear interaction. It will be deflected um, by its interaction with the nucleus. But it can also interact by the unpaired electron and be scattered that way. This is for x-rays and electrons. And sources of neutrons, how do we make neutrons or get them? The two ways. Yeah. yeah, this is complicated, or well, can be. So the simplest way to do it is to use polarized neutrons where you know the direction of the spin of your neutron and you see how that changes after the um, scattering process. So the phonons or the nuclei will not change the direction of the spin of the neutron, but the magnetic scattering can do so. Um, but there are other things you can do, like phonons tend to get stronger at large wave vectors and tend to get stronger with temperatures. So you can do temperature dependence and wave vector dependence also. 
to check with unpolarized neutrons. So two ways to make the neutron. The first is actually in a nuclear reactor. It's the fission process. Um, so here we have um, uranium-235. And uranium-235 can capture a spare neutron and go into excited state uranium-236, which is unstable and splits into barium and krypton, releasing three neutrons in the process and a lot of energy. So we started off with one neutron, and now we have three. And they have a lot of energy. So they're moving, and they can move to the next uranium-235 nucleus, get captured, excite it, split it, release more neutrons. So this is the chain reaction what happens inside the nuclear reactor. Um, and of course, the, the goal in the nuclear reactor is to utilize this energy. But as a byproduct, you can also get neutrons. The second method is spallation. And this is actually an accelerator. Um, so here we have now protons. You start with protons. And you accelerate them to very high speeds. This is now um, within a few percent of the speed of light around an accelerator, so they have a lot of energy. And then you fire them at a target, a heavy metal target. And because they have so much energy, they cause the targets to splinter and give off neutrons and protons. So this is a very high energy uh, technique compared to this. And for each initial proton that you fire, you might get 15 to 20 neutrons. They're very high energy neutrons, and you have to slow them down in order to make them usable. OK, I think I've gone past my time, so I will continue after lunch. Thank you.